When Frenchman the Marquis de Lafayette was 19, he came to America and was promptly made a major general by George Washington. The year was 1777, and the American Revolutionary War was underway. Political history podcaster and author Mike Duncan has written 471 pages of the story of Lafayette, called Hero of Two Worlds. Included in his book of the famous Frenchman is an account of his return to the United States, where he was celebrated in each of the 24 states. And that year was 1824, and Lafayette was 67. Mike Duncan, when's the first time you thought the Marquis de Lafayette was interesting? The first time I thought the Marquis de Lafayette was interesting was when I made a transition from writing about the American Revolution uh, on my podcast, Revolutions, to writing about the French Revolution. Um, each one of uh, uh, the show is d- divided into discrete series. And so I knew that Lafayette, who played a role in the American Revolution, was going to go on to play a role in the French Revolution. So I paid attention to him quite a bit more when he shows up as a teenager. Uh, and, you know, helps the Continental Army win independence from Britain. And everything that I saw about him and read about him in the American context, uh, he was very favorably portrayed. It was all very positive. He was a good influence. Uh, He played a positive role in the American Revolution. Then I moved over to the French Revolution and started reading about the Marquis de Lafayette in the revolution of the, uh, in, excuse me, in the context of the French Revolution, and I find him portrayed often in a very negative light. Uh, he is the bumbler Lafayette. He's Lafayette who was asleep at the switch again. He's Lafayette who was in over his head. Um, and that dynamic between his portrayal and the historiography between America and France w- made me very interested in him as a person. And then I continued to pay more attention to him as as my series went on, and I just moved chronologically through great revolutions. And then I just found him continuing to pop up over and over again during this great age of revolution between about 1775 and 1830, um, such that when I finally got to the revolution of 1830, and I find this guy coming back as an old man, um, trying to squeeze into his old National Guard uniform to go off and overthrow another king, um, this is when I started to say to him, I, I really want to go back and study him from the beginning. But that that point of the portrayal of him between uh, French history and American history is what makes him initially such a fascinating figure to me. You moved to France. Why and how long were you there? And what did you find? Um, Yes, I moved to France to write this book. We lived in Paris for three years uh, between 2018 and 2021, we just we just moved back to the United States um, in April of this year. Uh, I moved there after a series of conversations with my wife, which it started as, okay, I, I'm going to write this book about the Marquis de Lafayette. We're going to have to go to uh, France to do research. I need to get into the archives. There's some there's some other stuff over there, and we started saying, okay, well maybe we can go over there for the summer. Uh, that would be pretty cool. And then my, neither one of us was at that point geographically tied to a job. We were both sort of working from home. And um, we were like, well, people sometimes just go abroad for a year. Maybe we should just do that. And as we continued to talk, we were like, well, why don't we just move to France and see what happens? And so we I, it was me and my wife and my two kids who were um, like, uh, uh, I guess, five and two at the time. And we moved over there, and we, we lived uh, in Paris for three years, three very tumultuous years to have lived in Paris. I'm not sure that anybody who's lived in Paris for three consecutive years has ever not lived through tumultuous times. Uh, but our time there was also quite tumultuous. Uh, and um, then I wrote the book, and we decided to come home. What did you find in Paris and in France that uh, you couldn't find here to help you understand Lafayette. By the way, I have to apologize to you. I grew up in Lafayette, Indiana, so I will not be able to call him Lafayette like you're proper properly doing. So we'll just have to continue using the the uh, name the same way. But go ahead. We 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 all understand each other. Um, yeah. So what is over there? At at a minimum, there are of course you know archival documents and works um, that are held in the archives over there and in libraries over there. Uh, that aren't accessible in the United States. But the other 
the sort of part of it, the, the, the more sort of um, uh, more like metaphysical aspect to it is I was able to go to and inhabit the spaces where the events that I was writing about took place. Um, I lived in the Marais, which is kind of in inner Paris, which is very close to the Hotel de Ville. Uh, which is where a lot of these events in the book take place. I was just down the road, you know, from the Tuileries Palace. And I, if, if events were taking place at the Tuileries Palace, I could go down there with my notebooks and with my computer and sit in that space and inhabit that space. Um, I had to learn. I, I had taught myself French so that I could write this book. And then living over there, thinking in French, interacting with French people, um, witnessing a great deal of, uh, you know, I, I got to witness firsthand, for example, like the Gilets Jean riots, which, which were going on, you know, every Saturday for, um, uh, for quite a while while I was over there. So I actually saw what it looked like and felt like to be in Paris while there is riotous unrest out in the streets. Um, all of this, I think, informed my ability to tell a much richer version of the story. Um, I think I could have written a good book just, you know, sitting in my office in the United States. I think I was able to write a much better book and a much more insightful book uh, living in Paris for three years while I was writing a book about uh, with much of which takes place in Paris um, uh, than I otherwise would have. I grew up with a statue of Lafayette in the town square. When you walk in the House of Representatives, there's the big portrait on the wall behind uh, where the speaker is. If you go to the White House, there in Lafayette Square is a big statue of Lafayette. Why is all this happening, and what's the love affair that we have here in the United States with him? Well, the specific answer to all of that stuff is that Lafayette goes on a very famous tour of the United States in 1824 and 1825, roughly coinciding with the 50th anniversary of the American Revolution, which you know the Americans at the time knew it was the 50th anniversary. It was a big sort of celebratory moment. And Lafayette was invited back by President uh, James Monroe, who he was personal friends with, as Lafayette was personal friends with um, nearly all of the first run of presidents. Uh, so he was invited to come back. And the thing that makes Lafayette special at this point is that because – he joined the Continental Army as such a young man. I mean, he was commissioned as a major general in 1777 at the age of 19. He was much, much, much younger than all of his sort of uh, the people of his equivalent rank, including George Washington, who was his direct superior, such that when you get to 1824 and 1825, the Marquis de Lafayette is the only surviving major general left from the Continental Army, from that original cohort of officers who liberated the United States from uh, from Britain. So he has this uh, this very special connection. He is a living link to something that for the people who were alive in the United States in 18 in the 1820s, many of them were born. If you were if you were 30, 40 years old, you, you, had, you have a family, you've got kids, you've got a career, you know, you're a very sort of middle aged person you were still born after all of those events took place. Many, most of the people who were alive at the time uh, did not actually experience the American Revolution, and it was simply something that happened in the past. And now here's this guy, this, this very famous uh, political figure who is traveling the country, reminding people of what the revolution was, reminding people uh, of their shared national history. And the guy's an international celebrity. So, of course, when he shows up in places like, you know, Indiana and Illinois, which at the time were sort of frontier outposts of the United States, it was a very big deal for a guy who was that internationally renowned to just kind of come swinging through town. And so everywhere he goes, they name a county after him, a town after him, a school or a university after him. Uh, they say, oh, we raised some funds. We're going to build a statue to you. And so most of that sort of naming of things after Lafayette comes from that specific tour. Well, it was in May of 1825 that he went to Jeffersonville, Indiana, just for an afternoon. And it was in that same year that they created the city of Lafayette. And that's where they got the name. Um, what exactly. Kind of, what kind of visibility on this trip, and I've got a list here of over, I'm, I don't, you may know the exact number, over 120 places that he went in a period of uh, almost 13 months. Uh, what kind of visibility did he have when he was here for that trip back in 1824? Um, huge visibility. 
uh, everybody everybody knew he was uh, in the United States. Everybody knew when he was coming. Um, initially, he was only going to to make a, a very sort of normal run. He land he landed initially in New York. Uh, he went up to Boston, and then he was going to go down through Philadelphia to Washington D.C. and then go home. But when he showed up, the sort of uh, the, the reception that he received. Uh, not just from you know, political grandees, uh, the president, vice presidents, uh, governors and mayors, but also just from the regular people out in the streets who flocked to see him wherever he went. I mean, Lafayette uh, it was a, a flesh and blood human who had his vanities and enjoyed you know, receiving applause and acclaim, as I think we all uh, have a tendency to do. And as he's, he's, as he's cruising up and down the coast, he's, uh, he's realizing how much he's enjoying uh, go, basically having all these parties thrown in his honor um, and how much he's able to sort of be a living symbol of American history and American unity. And so he, he just, uh, he advances the trip and he's, he's, there's advanced people, um, you know, like, like with any tour that are going on ahead and saying, Hey, you know, the Marquis de Lafayette is planning on swinging through town in about eight weeks and wherever he, wherever he would go, the local mayor, the local notables would arrange huge parties for him. Um, so when he comes strolling, when he comes into town, there's always like a band and there's always a, there's always grandstand set up. There's a platform and people make speeches. Uh, and this goes on for, yeah, as you say, like, uh, like almost a year and a half. And he visited every one of the 30 states. This is actually one of his goals. His, his stated goal was to, was to visit all of the 30 states that were uh, existent at the time. And what makes him kind of a unique figure then, even among the, the generation of, founding, of American founding fathers, is that he actually saw and visited more of the United States as, just as a, as a French nobleman uh, than many of the people who were born, raised, lived, died as leaders of the United States. I mean, he saw more of the United States than George Washington did. He saw more of the United States than Jefferson did or Adams did. Um, so he has a sort a, a broader connection and a broader understanding of what the United States was than, than even his American contemporaries. So why would George Washington make him a major general at age 19? What, what did George Washington want from him? Uh, the decision to grant the Marquis de Lafayette's request to be a major general, which he was uh, yes, he was 19 years old. He had neither the experience uh, nor the resume to earn himself this commission in military terms. Uh, there, there's no, uh, nobody should be commissioning 19 year olds as major generals unless they're like, you know, Alexander the Great or something, uh, which Lafayette was not. But it was entirely political. Uh, he came over it, when, when he left France, it, he was leaving behind a social world. At Versailles, where he was, um, uh, he was in the social circle with Marie Antoinette, with with King Louis the Sixteenth. He knew these people personally. They were all basically the same age. Uh, he had married into the Noailles family, uh, which is second only to the Bourbon, the the royal family of France, uh, in terms of their power, wealth, importance, and influence. Uh, he is married into this family. He's he's a, he's a son-in-law of one of the most powerful families in France. So when he comes over to the United States and says, I am this French marquis, I would like to join your cause, uh, but I need you to make me a major general, the people in the Second Continental Congress uh, or you know, emissaries of the United States like Benjamin Franklin or George Washington, the leader of the Continental Army, are saying to themselves, my God, this kid who has just shown up is a direct conduit back to the king and queen of France. He, is, he knows personally the foreign minister of France, who is Comte de Vergen. Um, and all of those American leaders knew from very early in the conflict uh, that the way that the Americans were probably going to actually successfully break away from the British Empire was to enlist French support. They needed French money. They needed French arms. They needed French supplies. And more than anything else, they needed the French Navy. Uh, otherwise, they probably wouldn't be able to pull off this rather audacious thing they were trying to do, which is, which is declare independence. So Lafayette's commission as a major general and his entrance into George Washington's inner circle was entirely about cultivating Lafayette as a political asset so that he would then go back to France and say, oh, yeah, these Americans are great. They know what they're doing. Uh, their cause is just and we should give them money, arms and uh, probably send our Navy over there. At the height of France's support of the Revolutionary War, what what was involved in all? How many troops? ships, money. 
How how significant was that in in uh, um, the winning the American Revolutionary War? Um, well, in broad terms, I think that it won the American War. I think that French support ultimately is the decisive factor in uh, in winning the American War of Independence. I think that absent French support, we can maybe move through some sort of what if timeline where. Uh, uh, frequent American rebellions wind up with the British ultimately just wanting to wash their hands of this of this ongoing quagmire. Uh, but in terms of the immediate war that went on in the 1770s and early 1780s, the thing that makes it possible for the for the Continental Army to win the war is the arrival of all of those uh, French munitions and and French ships that I talked about, which were which was a significant investment on the part of the British, um, initi- or excuse me, on behalf of the French. They were fu- they funneled money, they the guns and supplies that they sent over in the initial in the initial shipments went directly to General Gates's army, who were fighting, uh, who were about to fight the Battle of Saratoga, and I don't think that the Battle of Saratoga is won without those supplies. Um, and then they order two different fleets, and we're talking about fleets of. Um, uh, dozens of ships and tens of thousands of men who are ultimately going to be involved in, uh, in sort of the French contribution to the effort because the French believe once they have gotten involved that they need to see this thing through to the end. So they invest the equivalent of, I think, a billion livres, which is an incredible amount of money, and which if you if you fast forward a little bit, there there was pushback inside the French government uh, saying, you know, we're, you know, our finances are shaky here. We're, our revenue is not exactly meeting our expenses. Um, can we really afford to invest like a billion in this, uh, in supporting this, 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 these upstarts over in the new world? And uh, I think that those, um, I think those critiques of it were correct. And ultimately, the French monarchy is going to go bankrupt in about five years after the American War of Independence. So I'm not sure it was actually in, in France's interest to get involved in it, but it certainly uh, was the decisive factor in uh, in America's independence. Let me ask uh, some personal uh, information in the background. He had, he died at age 76 in 1834, as you say, and his mm-hmm. wife, Adrian, died at age 48 in 1807, uh, what, uh-huh. what relate? What, what was her role in all this, and why did she die so young? Um, well, her role in all she was the daughter. Uh, as I said, she was the daughter of uh, the Noailles family, uh, which is one of the richest and most powerful families in France. Uh, Lafayette was himself a very rich orphan, and so he be- so Lafayette became this very desirable and eligible bachelor as a teenager. So they got paired up in a very traditional French arranged marriage. Uh, usually, in the marriages of French high society and the French nobility, marriages are family alliances. They are, you know, contractual mergings of estates. Uh, you are trying to maintain proper genealogical tables. Um, that's usually what what these things are about. And you don't really find love inside of your noble marriage. Uh, people are taking mistresses and lovers. That's where you find sort of romance. Uh, you don't actually find it with your wife or your husband. In the case of Lafayette and Adrienne, they actually liked each other quite a bit and got along with each other quite well. And she loved him and he loved her. And they had some kids together and they, and they raised their kids. They loved their kids. It was actually a, a fairly um, stable nuclear family in, ter- in what we would now consider to be a stable nuclear family, which made them quite unique in terms of um, uh, sort of the, the brethren that was around them, the, the, the social milieu they were running around in. There's a, a great quote that I used in the book from Abigail Adams, uh, when because when John Adams was minister, uh, was serving in, in France as a minister, they would frequently go over to the Lafayettes for dinner, and, and Abigail Adams was like, oh my God, this is crazy. I've met a French woman who actually likes her husband. Uh, so they had a, I think their relationship was very, was very positive. The discrepancy in their death dates, like why does Adrienne die early and Lafayette live so long, unfortunately comes down to, uh, her, it's really the, um, the cost of her devotion to him is I think where you have to, where you have to pinpoint that because after the French revolution, 
you know, once once they get caught up in the French Revolution and Lafayette is famously sort of evicted from the French Revolution, he runs away one step ahead of an arrest warrant that will probably lead to his execution. He winds up apprehended by the Austrians, who then stick him in uh, who stick him in prison for five years, most of which he spends in solitary confinement in very dismal conditions. Um, it was not house arrest in some chateau. Uh, Lafayette was living in essentially dungeons for a number of years. His health completely collapsed. And Adrienne con- con- continuously petitioned the Austrian government to release her husband as no as not somebody who they should be holding prisoner, or at the very least to let her and her daughters come join him in his confinement to make it sort of better for everybody. Like they were missing their father and their husband, and he was obviously all alone and in great deal uh, need of support. So eventually Adrienne personally petitions the emperor of Austria, who grants her permission, uh, her and her daughters, to come live with Lafayette in this prison. And they do that, and then Adrienne emerges from this quite sickly. Uh, It was not the, the conditions were not great. She developed a number of health problems. This is all in the latter 1790s that just plagued her for the rest of her then shortened life. And I, I do think that the fact that she died much younger than him was from complications of insisting that she go live with him in the prison in Olmutz. What's behind the children's name of George Washington Lafayette and Marie Antoinette, and I don't know if you pronounce it this way, Virginie? Yeah, Virginie. Um, well, it's, uh, you know, Lafayette had decided that upon entering George Washington's sort of inner circle, that George Washington was essentially adopting him as something of surrogate son. And Lafayette almost instantly started to view George Washington as a surrogate father because Lafayette was an orphan. His father died when he was two. Uh, so he never had really a strong father figure in his life. And he uh, he sort of imprinted that onto Washington that then became quite reciprocated. And I do think that it's, it's true that Washington and Lafayette had a father-son relationship. And uh, uh, so George Washington Lafayette was born in the midst of uh, uh, the American War of Independence. Uh, Lafayette just happened to be home on leave doing what his American friends wanted him to do, which was go back to France and lobby the French government for uh, for money, men and arms. And uh, and he uh, Audrain gives birth to their first son, who he names George Washington Lafayette in honor of who he considers to be his surrogate father. And then when after the war, when he has um, their third child who survives who's a, uh, and their second daughter, he names Virginie quite simply after the state of Virginia. And uh, there's also a, there's a lovely quote from Benjamin Franklin, who Lafayette was friends with, uh, congratulating the Lafayettes on the birth of their daughter, Virginie. And he says, oh, you know, you do you've done very well to name your daughter after the oldest of the states. And I think as you go forward, you know, like uh, Georgia Lafayette and Carolina Lafayette will make for great names. Um, I'm not so sure that you're going to want to get into like Connecticut Lafayette or Massachusetts Lafayette. That might be a bit harsh, um, but you're certainly well on your way uh, with, with naming uh, all of your kids after each of our 13 colonies, which then that didn't happen. That was the last of their daughters. What do you think he would have been like uh, to sit around and have dinner with? Um, well, I think he was he was a very amiable guy. Um, he was a very, by all accounts, by by sort of friends, enemies, opponents, even critics. Um, he was he was an amiable, easygoing kind of guy. He enjoyed good food. He enjoyed you know good drink. He enjoyed entertaining people. Uh, he enjoyed lively conversation. Um, I don't think he he held he held a, a weekly dinners for many, many years um, that, that brought in uh, usual, usually the centerpiece was like sort of American notables who were in France at the time would always come to Lafayette's for dinner. And then if you wanted to sort of meet American notables, you could go over to Lafayette's house on Monday night and they would have these like uh, these sort of ongoing soirees uh, once a week. But then he, uh, after the revolution and after the restoration and after the death of even of Adrienne, uh, Lafayette sort of brings this back and continues to host these events. So I think he's just a, a, a pretty, a pretty chill dude. He didn't have, um, an acerbic wit, you know, he's not one of these people who uh, you're going to go there and, and hear a great deal of sort of like witty barbs and witty repartee in the sense that he's going to have, you know, uh, the perfect bon mot 
to uh, to burn somebody in society. Um, it was very, very easy going. Now, much later in his life, uh, his grandson-in-law, who was a great memoirist named uh, Charles de Remusat, uh, found all of this to be a bit stifled and stilted uh, and a bit boring because it was so sort of nice and pleasant. There wasn't there wasn't any action. There wasn't any drama around uh, the Lafayette table, which, um, you know, if, if you're living in a world that is just filled with drama, I certainly would never turn down an invitation to dine with the Marquis de Lafayette. How tall was he? Uh, he was of medium tallish height. Uh, he was he was notably a bit taller than his contemporaries, but certainly he wasn't like George Washington. What about the, his weight? Uh, his he was he was thin and and wiry in his early years. Um, he was he was a bit gangly and awkward. He was he was one of those kind of like tall thinnish. Types, uh, and it took him a little bit to grow into his body. Uh, when he winds up in Olmutz, he, he lost almost all of his weight and ni- nearly died in an emaciated state. So when he gets out of prison, you know, after about 1800, uh, he puts on, uh, he becomes much stouter and paunchier. Uh, and as I said in the book, I, I think he, he carried around a well-earned paunch after his five years of solitary confinement. <laughs> We'll come back, of course, to Lafayette, but uh, go to Mike Duncan for a moment. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Redmond, Washington. Where did you go to school? I went to uh, Redmond High School, and then I went to college at Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington. What did you major in? I majored in political science uh, with a minor in philosophy. What did you do as soon as you graduated? Drifted. <laughs> Drifted where? Where did you go? Uh, I, 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 I moved down to Portland, Oregon, um, but I, I spent a good number of years sort of after graduating, I would say like four or five years, um, just sort of holding down jobs, uh, having a social life, uh, playing in some music bands, uh, but did not really have any serious direction. I didn't actually know what I was going to do with my life or what I was meant to do with my life. Uh, and didn't find any serious uh, direction until I came up with this notion of starting a podcast about Roman history, which I did in 2007. What instrument did you play? Uh, I played bass in my first band. I sang in my second band. What year did you meet your wife, and where did you meet her? I met my wife in 2006, um, and we, we worked together. I, I had a job at a fish counter in Portland, Oregon, cutting and selling fish, and she worked a, uh, for the, the produce side of that grocery store. And so she, she was working produce, and I was in fish, and we, uh, we met cute. How long did you work as a fishmonger? Uh, off and on for five years, which was my, which was my day job for most of the history of Rome when I was doing that. I, I did the history of Rome from 2007 to 2012. For most of that time, I was cutting fish as my day job. And where did you pick up the idea of being uh, doing a podcast on Rome? Um, it's, it's sort of a confluence of a couple things that, uh, number one, you know, podcasting, I, people tell me now, like, wow, you got in, sort of in the early days of podcasting in 2007, which is now, you know, almost 15 years ago, which is true. It was the early days of podcasting, but there were a lot of podcasts out there. And I discovered them right, right in that same period, right around when I met my wife, which is like 2006, 2007, and realized, you know, like, my God, there's so much sort of free information that is available out there. This is also right around when like, uh, like Stanford, uh, MIT started releasing just lectures from professors and they would just, you could just download them and listen to them. And I was like, my God, this is, this is amazing. I can just listen to, you know, world-class lectures about subjects that I'm interested in. Um, on the side, like what I was reading at the time in, in this whole period was I had fallen deeply in love with reading, um, sort of the, the ancient historians, like those, those classics of, uh, you know, I was reading Polybius. I was reading a bunch of Livy. I was reading a bunch of Plutarch. And I, I was reading all this material and went looking for a Roman history podcast or Roman history lectures to sort of expand my own understanding of Roman history, which is how I was teaching myself. And I discovered that there was nothing really like what I was looking for out there. 
And so I just, I was inspired by some podcast that I had listened to. I had what I believed to be this wealth of, uh, this wealth of information that was buried in all of these ancient histories that nobody ever really reads or pays attention to. Um, and if I can take that stuff and write it up as, as scripts and do a, do a narrative history of the Roman Empire from beginning to end, uh, that would be just a fun, interesting, uh, and, and, uh, and fulfilling thing to do. And so I, in July of 2007, I just started releasing episodes, and that's really what I've been doing ever since. There, in some, maybe it's your Wikipedia site, uh, it says that 100 million downloads of your, over the, over time of your podcast? Uh, yeah, I think I might even be over 200 at this point. How did, how did you do it? I mean, what, you know, people say nobody's interested in history, they're no, not interested in in-depth stuff, all they care about is Twitter and, you know, the, all the, the social media stuff. I yeah I find that actually not to be the case and a bit overblown. Um, so uh, my strategy was very simple. I just released episodes every week, and I would come back and uh, and each week I would have a, a couple dozen more listeners or maybe a couple hundred more listeners. There there was no moment, you know, I was never like featured on Oprah or anything where where there was some big breakthrough moment where um, I went from being unknown to being very known. It was just it was a it's been a very slow steady build over 15 years. That's how I have acquired my audience. Um, and a lot of what it is, it's people who are, of course, naturally interested in history, sort of history buffs and history geeks, which is a, which is a subset of culture that's always going to exist. But I've also found a great deal of people who emerge from high school, emerge from college, and they, for whatever reason, were turned off by history. And I do think it's true that, that there are times uh, or excuse me, there are ways that we teach history in school that has a tendency to turn people off to it and think, oh, I don't really like history. And then as they get older, they say to themselves, you know, my goodness, I, I really don't know anything about the world I'm living in. I don't know anything about how any of this, you know, happened. Uh, and we have now the Internet and podcasts and, you know, uh, uh, there's so many resources that people can turn to. And people turn to the history of Rome and people turn to revolutions. And I do my very best to explain to them in a detailed way what actually happened and what I have discovered, and some of it is self-selecting, I'm sure, of people who are so addled by, you know, by Twitter and social media that they have literally no attention span. Maybe those people are just walking away from me. But I have found many people um, who didn't expect to like it found that sort of the depth and the detail and the sort of the never – I don't skip over anything. I don't dumb anything down. I don't try to oversimplify stuff. Um, I just tell it to them as richly as I possibly can, and, and people have really responded to it and enjoyed it, um, which I think is I think is great. And so my experience with sort of uh, people's encounters with history is that people are very enthusiastic about history and love the detail uh, and love knowing what happened in the past. How many episodes of the History of Rome podcast? There were 189 episodes uh, that covers about a thousand years of Roman history. How long were they? Um, they start out, the, the early episodes are like, uh, maybe like 15 minutes long, you know, and I was just starting out by the end, they were usually about 25 minutes long. Um, and, uh, you know, by the, you know, revolutions episodes are, you know, I'm usually aiming for 30 or 35 minutes. If somebody wants to listen to them, where do they go? Uh, they go wherever they can procure podcasts. Um, they the, both the history of Rome and revolutions are everywhere. So that's um, you know Spotify. It's uh, it's I, iTunes is remains sort of the biggest driver. Um, but there are many different uh, podcast download apps uh, that you can get, and they will uh, they will be there. At what point in your podcast experience did you make enough money to live on? Um, that was. It was really when I started Revolutions. Um, I started doing advertisements for the History of Rome about halfway through the series. Um, and Audible.com would, would advertise twice a month, which allowed me to start working part-time doing the fish cutting and then ha part-time, like actually having time as opposed to just cramming everything into the nights and weekends, which is how I had been doing things. It gave me a little bit more space uh, to, to work on the show. 
And then when the history of Rome ended, I was living in Austin, Texas by that point. My wife got a job in Madison, and we moved up to Madison with our son. And when we made that move, I said, I've got, I've got an idea for another show, like not that the history of Rome is over, and I want to, I want to do it about great political revolutions. And what I would like to try to do is generate enough income just from the podcast that I don't need to go get another job. And uh, my wife and I worked it out that like, yeah, let's let's give it a shot. I think, you know, if you devote yourself to it full time, we can make it work. And we agreed that if it was working after a year, I could keep doing it. And if I wasn't making enough money doing the podcast after a year that I would then go try to find another job because we did have a we did have a a kid at that point. Um, But it worked and I made enough money. (laughs) I, I haven't had a job since. Where do you live now? Uh, we are back uh, living outside of Madison. And when you were cutting fish and doing your Rome podcast, did you'd say to somebody, I, I, you know, I got to go do my podcast, what kind of reaction did you get? Oh, it was, um, you know, looking back on it, it, it's, um, it, was, it was actually quite, it was fun because I would have my relationship with, people at work who was just like, you know, we're just like grocery store guys cutting fish. Uh, and they would say, wait, what do you, what do you do at night? And I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm writing a complete history of the Roman empire and podcasting it. And like, that's crazy. I, you know, and then we would go back to talking about sports and, and, and swearing a lot, which is what people who cut fish do. Um, but then there were also then people who were fans of mine, uh, who would know me only from the history of Rome and only from this sort of like sort of staid historical persona that I had. And they would say like, wait, what do you, what do you do all day? I'm like, Oh yeah, I go and I cut fish all day. That's what, that's, that's what I do. Um, so it was, it was a bit of a double life, uh, that I was leading, um, which was, uh, which was, which was fun. And then eventually, you know, it, it was also nice to then leave, uh, leave the stench of cutting fish behind and just, uh, devote myself entirely to history. When was the last time you cut fish? Oh, it was, uh, 2012 probably. And how about your wife? Did your wife work? Yeah, she was in, uh, she was in graphic design. And so she was working for, uh, uh, various sort of like graphic design and, and ad agencies. Uh, and she has actually now, uh, switched her career as a result of sort of the, the blender of, uh, moving to Paris, living in Paris, and then moving back and trying to figure out what she wants to do. Uh, and she has actually, um, uh, she's moved over into libraries. So she just got a job as a circulation manager at a library, which, um, which we're all very happy about. What is your podcast now, today? I mean, what, you know, podcast, the series? Yeah. Uh, it's, re- so I'm doing Revolutions now, and I have been doing Revolutions since uh, 2013, which is, uh, as I said, earlier i take discrete political his uh discrete political revolutions and tell them one after the other in chronological order so i started with a series on the english revolutions which is like cromwell uh versus charles the first and then i did the american revolution the french revolution which was 55 episodes long i did a 19 part series on the haitian revolution i did uh you know a 30 episode series on simone bolivar and spanish american independence i've done the revolutions of 1830 and 1848 i did the paris commune i did a 27 part episode or excuse me 27 part series on the mexican revolution uh, and i am currently enmeshed in what will be the final uh, series of the show on the russian revolution which i'm right now working on the 71st episode of uh, a series on the Russian Revolution. How long does it take you to write a podcast episode? Uh, I spend about 30 hours a week to get about 30 minutes of material between, you know, the the reading, the note taking, the scripting of it, because I just read scripts. And most of what I do, I consider myself more than anything else to be a writer. Uh, That's sort of what my job is. Uh, on, a, on a practical level is, is I'm taking notes, outlining things, uh, doing drafts, editing those drafts. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's about 30 hours of work a week. When you decided to do this book on the Marquis de Lafayette, how many publishers did you go to and why did public affairs books buy it? Um, well, the, the, the Lafayette book only went to public affairs and they bought it. Uh, thank you, public affairs, because they published my first book. 
Uh, so, so my first book, which came out back in 2017, which is called the storm before the storm, the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic, um, was, was rooted in sort of the history of Rome and, um, uh, and, and that side of my, and that side of my career, which did well. Um, and then when I was, when I was coming out of that, you know, the publisher came back and said, you know, we get sort of a first crack at whatever your next book is, you know, they had whatever it is, the right of first refusal. Um, and I presented them this this outline and this proposal for a book about the Marquis de Lafayette and they loved it and bought it and so I didn't I didn't have to shop it around as you point out in your book there were three revolutions that uh, the Marquis was involved in let's go to the first one here in the United States his first battle where he was wounded was what uh the battle of Brandywine how seriously was he wounded he was uh he was wounded. He was, he was shot through. He took a musket ball through the calf, uh, which went right through his leg and led to, uh, led to a great deal of bleeding, um, but was in no way life threatening. Uh, and he, he wrote a, he wrote a great letter home to Adrienne while he was convalescing because he, he did have to, he was laid up for a little bit where he said, you know, if any, if anybody would like to have a, a war wound um, that looks great, but didn't actually, you know, isn't actually life-threatening in any way. They should come take a look at mine. It's basically perfect. So what battles did he fight in or lead in? And when did everybody say, this guy knows what he's doing? Well, I think um, Brandywine itself was the first time that George Washington realized that he had not merely been saddled with some rich French teenager who had to be kept around for political reasons and that Lafayette might actually be a soldier worthy of full participation in the Continental Army and somebody who could be trusted. Uh, obviously, the Continental Army loses the Battle of Brandywine. This is what leads directly to the fall of Philadelphia in September of 1777. But in that battle, Lafayette is wounded. The Continental Army has to retreat uh, and as they are falling back quite chaotically under under withering British fire, uh, there's a, there's a there's a bridge that's going to uh, allow many Continental Army soldiers to to retreat safely. And this Lafayette wounded sees that the bridge is not being held, sees that it's all just chaos, and without anybody telling him to do it, organizes a defense of that one particular bridge that allows for the rest of the army to sort of make their way to safety uh, and not be captured or killed. And this is where George Washington then finds him, uh, wounded uh, and having organized the defense of a critical bridge so that all of these people who Lafayette doesn't even know, you know, he's only been in the army for about three or four weeks at this point. It's, uh, and, and sort of selflessly organizing uh, something for their safety. That's the moment when Washington, I think, thinks to himself, uh, Lafayette is something different and unexpected. And then over the course of the next couple of weeks and months, he uh, sort of gradually increases the amount of uh, responsibility that Lafayette has. Uh, and Lafayette performs well every in every task that he is given until uh, until Washington goes ahead and just says, OK, yeah, you know, you're actually a full major general. We're bringing you into this thing completely. So how long was he in the United States during that revolution? When did he go back to France, come back to the United States and then go back to France? Um, so he, he remains in France, or excuse me, he remains in, in the United States, like through, like he's there for Yorktown. Um, he's there for the battle of Monmouth courthouse. Um, he was, he didn't, he didn't do great at Monmouth courthouse. You know, that, that battle doesn't usually enter into his own, even personal descriptions of his, uh, uh, uh of his service in the United States, because that was a bit of a debacle. Uh, under General Charles Lee, uh, who Lafayette was serving with at the time. Um, but then he he does go back to France for a year uh, and works very closely with Benjamin Franklin to lobby the French government for, you know, for the, the many, uh, excuse me, the money and the men and the arms that the Continental Army needs. And then he comes back over roughly about the same time that the Rochambeau expedition is sent by the French. And Lafayette continues to serve. Uh, he uh, uh, all the way through um, Yorktown. So he's at he's at Yorktown in uh, at the end of 1781, and is actually before Rochambeau, uh, Rochambeau's army, Washington's army, and the French Navy show up to truly complete the the bottling up of Cornwallis and the capture of Cornwallis. Uh, Lafayette is down there, kind of on his own, 
with a small army, and he has been instructed to make sure that Cornwallis doesn't get out of Yorktown before everybody can show up and uh, really put the screws to him. As you probably know, uh, there's a 14th Street Bridge here in Washington from Virginia to the district, and it's called the Rochambeau Bridge. Why is that name so important at that time? Uh, Rochambeau was the leader of the French expeditionary force, a French land army that had been sent over uh, to help the Continentals, and, and they were they were it, it was um it was a it was a joint operation, you know, not unlike you know what was going on in World War One and World War Two, where you have sort of two different countries on the same side of of a battle. With this being the first time that the French and the United States, what's going to become the United States, are doing this, uh, and so Rochambeau is the leader of that French expeditionary force. Yorktown, sum up what happened there and the importance of the French. How many Frenchmen, how many French soldiers were there at Yorktown? Um, I am not going to be able to quote to you the exact number. It was somewhere, by by the time the Navy shows up and offloads their guys, it's somewhere around ten or 15,000 um, who, were, who were then augmenting uh, roughly an equal number of Continental soldiers and, uh, and militiamen. Uh, who had been who who had been called up to Yorktown, and then that also were including the French Navy that is going to blockade Cornwallis. And essentially, what happens at Yorktown is that Cornwallis is in this town that is that is out m- mentally. You can picture him out on a peninsula that is then uh, uh, besieged from the land side by the French and the Americans, and blockaded on the sea side by the French. And this is what is going to prevent him from getting away. Um, and it's not even just the French Navy that is so important, but Washington, being a bright guy and, and knowing um, that the, he has all these French military engineers who really know their European siege craft, uh, Washington hands over leadership of uh, constructing the siege lines to these French military engineers uh, who then uh, go off and do their stuff and they win the battle. So uh, it is really hard to to overestimate how important the French were to all this without, I think, underestimating how important the Continental Army was and the militia was and George Washington was to all this. Obviously, the French can't just come over and do it for themselves. Um, I don't think either one of them could have done it for themselves. You say at age 24 he went back to Paris. Um, before we uh, go to the F- French Revolution, why uh, so much archival material at Cornell? Oh, goodness. Um, there is so much archival material at Cornell because in, in the mid-1950s, uh, they were going through Lafayette's final residence where he lived for the last, like uh, I guess, 34 years of his life at Lagrange, which is outside of Paris. And it's, a, it's kind of an old squat castle-y looking building. And in one of the towers, they found a room that had been sealed for about 100 years, and it was full of documents from Lafayette. It was basically, it was Audrey N's uh, collected correspondence, everything that she had saved during their, their life and then uh, uh, her children had saved. And so there were about 15,000 documents that they found in there. And uh, French archivists, French historians went in there. Uh, Americans were, of course, very, very interested in anything that has to do with Lafayette, far more so even than the French were. And they brokered an agreement where kind of all anything that had directly to do with Lafayette's uh, 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 time in America would come back to the United States. And anything that had to do with the French Revolution or French history would go to the French National Archives. And the ambassador to France at the time just so happened to be a uh, a Cornell alumnus. And so he arranged for it to be placed in the archives at Cornell, which is where it sits to this day. It's in it's in Ithaca. So I got to so I got to go spend three weeks at Ithaca. Uh, researching a French nobleman. Where in the United States uh, do they have other archival material? Um, uh, Lafayette College has some, uh, and there's also, gosh, I forget what the other one. I think there is there one in Indiana. I'm, am I <laughs> am I going to am I going to forget the one that's over there? There's one in the Midwest that I didn't make it to, um, but a lot of it uh, was facsimiled, and uh, there are digital records of a lot of that stuff. But the, the main the main one is the uh, the, the one at Cornell. So if you ask the French today what they thought of Lafayette's role in the French Revolution, what would they say, and what year was it, and what, what, did, what did he do? Um, the, what the French would say, they would, they would roll their eyes a little bit, or at least this is sort of 
my encounters with people, uh, librarians, and archivists, um, they tend to view Lafayette as somebody who started something because he, he was very he was very very involved in the French Revolution and all events leading up to the French Revolution in the later 1780s and 1789 he w- he was a major figure but they view him as somebody who was a bit of a lightweight who was in over his head um, and who was overtaken not just by events but by sort of superior political actors um, and French history and French historians have a tendency to to fall into two camps which is you either have this sort of conservative traditionalist viewing of French history who they are just major critics of the French Revolution, uh, you know, root branch. They think that the revolution was a mistake, that everything that these revolutionaries had tried to do to the divinely ordained legitimate monarch of France, who's the Bourbon royal family, uh, was bad and wrong. And so they don't like Lafayette for having participated in trying to uh, saddle a constitution uh, on the French monarchy, whereas on the other side, there's a great deal of um, people on the left in French politics and in French uh, and in the French Academy who make heroes of Robespierre and Danton and Marat and Desmoulins, who believe that um, the aggressive advance towards universal human rights, a republic as opposed to a monarchy, uh, the overthrow of feudalism and the old aristocracy were all good, and that for whatever sort of um, uh, uh, blood was spilt or eggs were cracked making the omelet of the French Republic, that it was, all, uh, it was all worth it. And the thing is, all of those guys who were advancing aggressively towards um, declaring a, a universal republic were also enemies of Lafayette because they saw Lafayette defending a constitutional monarchy as opposed to being willing to go all the way to a republic, which is very true. Lafayette uh, did not want to go as far as they wanted to go. So there's really nobody alive in France right now who looks to Lafayette as somebody who they uh, like or admire or who was trying to do the kinds of things that they thought were likable and admirable. He's, he's caught in the middle between these two sides um, and therefore is, is a bit homeless in terms of French historical memory. If you want to go to places Lafayette in France, how far is Lagrange outside of Paris and what's there now? Uh, it's about an hour outside of Paris. Um, it's, it's, it's in a very weird spot right now, you know, like COVID has turned everything kind of upside down. Um, technically it is a, it is a little tourist destination that you can go to that so far as I can tell only Americans ever actually go out there. Not many people in France, it's, it, they're not super interested in it. Uh, and then also his, his childhood home, the ancestral home of the Lafayette, is down in Auvergne. It's a place called Chavignac, which is down in sort of south central France. Um, in a very, it, actually, in a very beautiful area. And, and getting to spend a week down there was, was really, really great. Because um, he did kind of come from the rustic provinces originally. Um, and that, too, is a, it's a museum to Lafayette, uh, frequented by Americans <laughs> almost entirely. Uh, as you well know, he his wife died in 1807, and he did not remarry. Why not? He promised her that he would not. Um, that's that's it. That he had he had a couple opportunities, and uh, and when she died, when she was dying, he said, "I will never remarry," and then he never remarried. What was his role in the 1830 revolution? His role in the 1830 revolution was pretty decisive, honestly. Um, and it was, you know, getting back to your very first question, you know, like what interested you about Lafayette when I delved into the revolution of 1830, which I was familiar with, but not in its, you know, in, in sort of the, the gr- nitty gritty minute by minute details of the revolution. I knew that Lafayette comes back as this sort of venerable old figure, uh, you know, a, a relic of the first French revolution, one of the few people who was left alive, um, from the first French Revolution, that he sort of gives his his moral blessing to replacing King Charles X with this new citizen king, Louis Philippe of the Orléans family. Um, but he was much more involved in French politics at the time. Uh, he was much more decisive in terms of actually the turn of events during these critical days in July of 1830 when really chaos had broken out. There were riots in Paris. Uh, There was clearly a movement to overthrow Charles X. 
but because of a bunch of things that Charles X had done, Charles X is one of the great uh, figures in history who was overthrown because of a series of blunders that he made. There, there was no reason for Charles to have been overthrown except his own um, sort of stubborn incompetence. And when he gets overthrown, you know, we, what, can, what can the French do? They can maybe bring back a Bonaparte, restart the empire. They can declare another republic. Uh, they can give it over to maybe a grandson of the Bourbons and try again with them. They can go with the Orleans. And Lafayette is a figure inside of Paris especially who has a great deal of influence with a lot of the younger radicals, a lot of the younger Republicans, a lot of the younger liberals, the students uh, looked up to him as somebody who represented the ideals of 1789. And so when he said to them, look, I think that the best way we can possibly go at this moment is to hand power to Louis Philippe, they accepted that. And I think that's what allows Louis Philippe to move into power. Lafayette, within a matter of months, comes to regret this decision um, and and believes uh, ultimately that he was played by the Orleanists, which he kind of was. Um, but he did have a great deal of influence over, over those events. I think more than uh, he's often given credit for, even in French history, I think his role in that revolution was also decisive. A couple of um, human interest stories, one about you and then one about Lafayette. The one about Lafayette happened just a couple of days before he went to my home state of Indiana when he went to Jeffersonville uh, when the mechanic ship sunk. What was yeah. what happened? And I gather he lost some very valuable things there. Yeah, he um, so they're on a riverboat They They were they were they were going up the Mississippi uh, and then they were cruising around. They were, they were, they were outside of Kentucky. They were on their, their way to Kentucky. And um, the, the riverboat simply ran aground into a barge uh, at around midnight. And they were, they were sleeping in their cabin. And all of a sudden there's all these alarms going off, um, for, which is you know, shouting at the time. It's not like they had alarms. Um, but there was a great deal of shouting. So they're like, well, what's going on? And the captain says, look, the boat is sinking. We have to get off the ship. It's going to sink. So Lafayette, he's an old dude at this point. You know, he's in his 60s. So they get him onto, uh, you know, onto a life raft. They get him ashore. Uh, his secretary and his son, George, is with him on this on this whole trip. They did their best to rescue what they could out of the cabin. But it was, I mean, we're really like shove papers into a satchel and then make a break for it level of, you know, what the, what the level of emergency was. Um, and ultimately they did get, they, they did get out. There were no fatalities. Everybody, everybody was fine in the end. And they spent the night um, uh, trying to dry off next to a bunch of bonfires that they had made. Um, but they lost, they lost a bunch of correspondence and a bunch of notes. And uh, the, his secretary, who ultimately writes this, this, this actually really wonderful uh, two volume account of, of Lafayette's journey through America, which, which acts as a, as a very nice sort of prologue or prequel to um, democracy in America by Alexei de Tocqueville, I think, Honestly, I, I'd never heard of it before I started researching the book, but now I kind of think that it's really valuable to read those two books in tandem. If you've read Democracy in America, um, I would read Auguste Levasseur's account of Lafayette's time in America. But he remarks, um, you know, in the midst of all this, it's like, well, you know, I got to say, like, we had a lot of correspondence and there was a huge backlog and we were just trying to get to as much of it as we could. But frankly, we were overwhelmed by the amount of correspondence that we were dealing with. And so the fact that the boat sank and destroyed all that correspondence was not actually the worst thing in the world for us. And it allowed us to kind of move forward with a clean slate, um, which is a bit like, you know, your, your email inbox just accidentally gets wiped out uh, and suddenly you don't have any. Um, outstanding emails that you have to deal with that you haven't been dealing with, which is, it sounds like, what was happening to them. I also read that he intended to take back dirt from each of the 24 states to uh, put in his gravesite, and because of this ship sinking, he lost that. But uh, yep. as, as, you, as you know, uh, where he, he's buried at the church, and he does have some dirt there from the American soil, and was he an American citizen? Um, okay, so yeah, there's two questions there. One is is what he's buried under is soil from Bunker Hill, because the the great monument. If you've been to Bunker Hill now, there's a there's this huge monument that uh, was erected when he was there. Like they didn't they didn't send this up because he was there, but he just happened to be there at the same time. So as they were digging out the foundation for that monument, he said, "Can you throw some of that dirt in a sack for me so I can take it home?" Um, 
and that's what he took home, and that's what he's uh, that's what he's buried under. Even though uh, Lafayette himself didn't fight at Bunker Hill, he was still back in France when all that happened. Um, as to the second question, which was what? What was the second question? I have an answer to it. Um, oh, God, I was listening to your your uh, your answer to the first question, talking about the the gravesite. I assume uh, near the church, and I'm, I'll, I'll just expand on that. Can people visit that if they're interested in this whole story? Yeah, he's buried in a in a private cemetery. Which, if you hear, oh, he's buried in a private cemetery, you might not think it's a it's not something you can get at, um, but it is. It's called Picpus Cemetery. Um, in the Picpus neighborhood of Paris. Uh, it's run by, it's a church. Um, you can pay three euro to get in if the guy is at the door. It's very French. Like, if the guy is at the door, uh, you can give them three euro and go in um, because it also happened to be a major dumping ground of bodies from the Reign of Terror. Um, and so there's actually a, a, a rather sizable memorial to many of the victims of the reign of terror in addition to it having uh, being the family plot of the noai family so lafayette and uh and adrian are buried side by side in picpus cemetery and you can't go there and there's a, been an american flag flying over his grave continuously for i don't even know how many hundreds a couple hundred years almost 200 years um the the question that i forgot that i'd ask you is was he an american citizen ah uh, yes so I think that Lafayette was an American, was, yes, an American citizen. Uh, he was granted honorary American citizenship just like, just like maybe 10 or 15 years ago. It was during the Bush administration where he's one of the, uh, one of the people, he's like a dozen people who have honorary American citizenship. Having gone through his life in some detail now, I personally believe that Lafayette was an American citizen as of uh, the end of 1784, uh, when he is traveling through the United States in 1784, many municipalities like New York City are saying, oh, Lafayette, you are a you are a citizen of New York. We're declaring you a citizen of New York. Many, many cities and towns did this uh, in 1784 when he was there. The Maryland state legislature actually declares him a, to be a natural born citizen of Maryland. And if you follow that thread through the Constitution, which the, Consti the, the Constitution is originally drafted in 1789, sort of creates reciprocal recognition of citizenship of the several states because they were just now being unified. You were a citizen of Massachusetts, not a U.S. citizen. But Lafayette's claim and the, the Maryland state legislature's declaration of him as a natural born citizen of Maryland gets fed into 1789 makes him the equivalent of a natural born citizen of Maryland as recognized by the constitution. And then when you move forward all the way to the 14th amendment and start getting a real definition of citizenship of the United States, um, which was an ongoing legal concept, I don't see any way that you can legally take what Lafayette was able to claim in 1784 and which had been granted to him by the Maryland state legislature and not say he was actually a complete full natural born citizen of the United States. All right, last question. I've kept you too long. Um, the story about your trip to Auvergne, his uh, childhood home, stranded for three days in a snowstorm, and kidney stones. Tell that story. <laughs> oh, my God. That's multiple stories. Um, yes, when we went to Auvergne, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, it's, it's up in a little bit of a mountainous part of France, and it was, uh, it was October. And there was a freak snowstorm, a freak blizzard at the day we were trying to leave. We were trying to drive back in a rented car to Lyon to catch a train back to Paris. And as we were driving, the car simply broke down. Uh, the, the car just completely shut down. We were in this very tiny village. Uh, it rained, excuse me, it snowed about two feet overnight. So nobody could get to us. No mechanic could get to us. The rental car company couldn't get to us. Uh, and we were just stranded for three days in this very, uh, in this really just tiny village. There, there weren't more than like 150 people living there. We were in um, the one hotel in town. We were the only guests at the hotel um, and spent three days being taken care of by this very nice elderly French couple uh, who, who kind of were like, oh, my God, you guys are, you guys are really screwed here. 
um, and, and really took care of us. They, they fed us. Um, they did a lot of the, the brokering with the insurance companies and the rental car companies because our French was, uh, was rudimentary at that point. Um, so one, one of my big takeaways from my time in France is that uh, the French reputation for being uh, sort of mean or snobby or not helpful and rude, um, my three years in France, I think that's a, all of that is a put on. Uh, and that the French people are actually very nice, generous, uh, lovely, and warm people. They just don't want people to know it. Um, as for the kidney stones, yeah, when I was trying to finish the book, I uh, this is in September of last year, I succumbed to a series of kidney stones that were so large they could not be passed in the way that one might normally pass a kidney stone. And so I had to, I was on the operating table uh, for them to do procedures on me uh, four times over the course of about six months. And that was while I was trying to finish the book, I was sort of in and out of the hospital, um, which I was also very well taken care of by the nurses, by the doctors, um, by uh, my friends and sort of uh, people who are helping me in France. Um, so it was all, it was all very grueling at the end. And there were, there were definitely some things that I had to persevere through to finish the book. Um, but it was done, and uh, and ultimately, looking back on it, you know, I'm just sort of grateful that everything went as well as it did, um, and that I got as much help as I did. Our guest has been Mike Duncan. The book is called Hero of Two Worlds. You can find his podcasts anywhere there are podcasts. Revolutions is his current podcast, and also he has the story of the history of Rome. And we thank you so much for uh, spending this hour with us. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.